It's a somewhat unusual Lenten journey uh, for a number of reasons now, but before all of this hit, we were doing a sermon series on battles of the heart. And it's a sermon series that considers how if we aren't careful, we can very easily let other things slip into the place that really only God can fill in our lives. And in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Tamara shared with us how fear can become that thing that takes over for us. Fear can really become an idol um, if we let it. And then last week, Pastor Stan talked to us about how the temple of power, which includes success and money and achievement, how that sort of group of things can take over our lives in much the same way if we let it. So today we continue on that same path we are considering what happens when we let other things in our lives gain priority over our relationship to God. But today we're gonna to talk about idolatry in a way that might surprise some of you. Because today I wanna to suggest that the relationships in our lives that are the most meaningful and the most rewarding can also battle for our hearts. And sometimes we let those earthly relationships gain so much footing that they beat out God's rightful place in our lives. But before we get too deeply into those ideas, of course, I wanna share a word of scripture. So as we prepare to read God's holy word, would you bow your heart with me in prayer? Gracious God, we come to you now with hope in our hearts that in your word we can find comfort and grace and truth. Help us to step aside so that all we hear and all we see and all we feel in this Holy Scripture is you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be reading from the book of Genesis this morning, chapter 29, verses 31 through 35. And I'm just going to dive in because we're going to talk about it in some detail here in a few minutes. So hear now the word of the Lord. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive. But Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has, been, has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his holy word. Thanks be to God. So obviously, I want to begin with a story. Because as we know, here at Sierra Vista, all good sermons start with stories. <laughs> Stan, I got an amen from Stan on that one. In the South Pacific, here's the story. In the South Pacific, there is a string of tropical islands that together make up the nation of Vanuatu. These islands are covered with mountains and volcanoes, and one of the southernmost islands of this nation has a group of folks on it who have some pretty interesting ideas. They have an ancient legend that there was once a pale-skinned son of a mountain spirit who would travel over the seas to a distant land to find a powerful woman to marry. They believed that while the son was gone from Vanuatu, he would marry a powerful woman, and they, even still to this day, they trust wholeheartedly that in time, the spirit, the son of the spirit, would return to the mountains near the village of Yononen. For these island people, this was a wonderful legend for several millennia, a delightful fairy tale for them. Um, that is, until the early 20th century came along. It was then that the United Kingdom claimed parts of Vanuatu. And later, in the 1950s, as specifically, Queen Elizabeth visited this archipelago of islands. 
And all of this would have been fine and entirely uneventful, except, and there's always an except in good stories, except on Queen Elizabeth's visit, she brought with her Prince Philip of Edinburgh, her husband, who is a tall, pale-skinned man who happens to be married to a woman who has shown great respect because of her position of power. So the people of Yononen realized immediately how closely Prince Philip fit the son in the old legend. And as a result, Prince Philip himself came to be revered and even worshiped as a divine being by those in this remote village. And so what anthropologists today call the Prince, call the Prince Philip movement exists as this strange cult-like devotion to Prince Philip even as the prince himself nears his 99th birthday this summer. The folks in the Yononen village still believe that Prince Philip will return to bless them, even if it's in his afterlife. So at first glance, the story of Prince Philip and this group of folks from this remote village, well, truthfully, the story seems kind of crazy. Prince Philip is a god. It just seems so un outlandish, and it's really pretty unbelievable. But it's a story that got me to thinking. How often do we do the same thing that the folks in this village are doing? How often do we fashion in our own minds an idea of what a person should be, and then hang on to that idea no matter what? Even to the point that this person becomes the largest most important priority in our lives. We do this. We make relationships our priority. We have this tendency with our partners, with our children, and with basically any other connection. The truth is that in our society, we are all sold this bill of goods about who people are and who they should be, especially in relationships. And it doesn't matter if those relationships are romantic or parental or friendly. We are told daily that relationships will cure what ails us. Our significant others will make us happy. Our kids will make us fulfilled and proud. And our friends will make us important and worthy somehow. From the time we are small children, we are exposed to these misconceptions absolutely everywhere in the fairy tales that Disney brings us, in the reality TV shows that are all over now, and in the endless feed that social media provides. Eventually, we blindly accept this idea that a single relationship can't fix what's wrong in our lives, and we come to believe that the holes in our hearts are person-sized, spouse-sized, child-sized, or friend-sized, when in reality the holes, the hollowness and the need that we all carry can only be filled by God. Which leads us neatly back to our scripture for today. If there ever was a gal who was convinced that a relationship, that a guy specifically, was the be all and the end all, it was Leah. She is totally besotted by Jacob. I mean, for real. She probably had those little cartoon hearts floating above her head. And in this part of Genesis, we see clearly that more than anything, Leah wants to please Jacob. She wants to make him happy. As we are told in verse 31, she wants what she doesn't have, Jacob's love. And the only way she thought she could make Jacob love her was to give him a son. And after their firstborn son is, arrives, in verse 32, she says, Surely my husband will love me now. And the scripture doesn't say it right here, but we already know this from earlier in the chapter of Genesis. We know that the woman who already has Jacob's love is Leah's older sister, Rachel. And the only reason that Jacob didn't marry Rachel first was because of the trap that the father of these two women used to get Jacob to marry Leah instead. And so Leah, in this weird second place position, 
she tries again. In verse 33, we find that Leah gives birth to another son, saying that even after giving him two sons, she still does not have Jacob's love. And I can't imagine how that must feel to Leah. She is the little sister of Rachel, who earlier in this chapter of Genesis is described as beautiful and shapely. But all we are told about Leah is that she has a delicate or gentle eye. It's kind of an awkward description, a gentle eye. But some Bible scholars believe that this description stems from Leah's being heartbroken and weepy so often. Others believe that Leah was just not attractive, or at the very least, less attractive than her older sister, Rachel. And so here is Leah, feeling entirely unloved by her husband and living in the shadow of this beautiful woman who clearly has Jacob's love. But Leah is not a quitter, and so she tries again. In verse 34, Leah says, Now, at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Maybe he will become attached to me? Wow. <laughs> She's gone from wanting Jacob's love to just being okay if he's attached to her. That one kind of hurts. But it's clear throughout the Old Testament that Leah is made of pretty stern stuff. And so it is that when her fourth son is born, she seems to realize something. With this son's birth, she seems to stop hoping for Jacob's love in quite the same way. Instead, in verse 35, she says very simply that for this son, her fourth son, a son she named Judah, a son who would share the name with the kingdom of Judah, and a son who would become a direct ancestor to King David and to Jesus Christ himself. For that son, Leah says that she will praise the Lord. She doesn't desperately ask for Jacob's love. She doesn't hope for merely for Jacob's attachment. And she doesn't expect Jacob to fill the hurt in her heart. Not anymore. It's here, it's right here, when Leah sees clearly that the hollowness and the hurt and the brokenness in her own heart can only be filled and healed and made whole by God. So remember our shape sorter from children's time? I wanna get back to it a little bit. So you see, it's kind of like our bodies and I'm gonna explain that. In each one of our bodies, there is a special place in the cells where oxygen is supposed to sit. It's kind of like one of these little slots on this shape sorter. Chemically speaking, the slots in your, in your cells are shaped just perfectly to hold an atom of oxygen. They fit exactly where they're supposed to go, which really, for the most part, is a really cool setup. But sometimes a problem arises. And the problem is, is that carbon monoxide is shaped almost identically to oxygen. So that it also fits perfectly into those exact slots where only oxygen should go. And when carbon monoxide starts to go into those slots where oxygen should be, and when it does that in mass quantities, our bodies start to suffocate. And we don't even realize that this is happening. We think we're fine. After all, we are breathing. Our lungs are expanding and constricting. And we feel air coming in and going out. We're going through all the, all the actions, all the motions of breathing. All systems are normal, right? Well, wrong. The truth is, is that we are actually being asphyxiated. With imposters taking the place of oxygen, that we so desperately need, we are suffocating, even though we don't even know it. That is what we know as carbon monoxide poisoning. And all too often, we let relationships poison our systems in much the same way. Now hear me say this, I am not saying, not in any way, that relationships are bad for us. 
Just the opposite. In fact, in Genesis, we are told that God gave us relationships. He saw that we needed one another, and so he created us just for that. So relationships aren't bad for us, but what is bad for us is when we let individuals in our lives, whether it be our spouses, our children, or our friends, when we let any of these take the place of God, when we try to put a person in God's place, then our lives and our hearts enter dangerous space. We lose perspective and we face a kind of spiritual poison. Because here's the thing, what if the purpose of every relationship isn't to make us feel better? What if none of the connections that we have to the other people in our earthly lives is intended to really fix what is hurt and broken and missing in each one of us? Instead, what if the real spiritual objective of every relationship, every partner, every parent, and every pal, what if the reason we have each and every one of them in our lives is to serve as a means of grace that allows us to be more like Christ, more giving, more gracious, and more willing to live in the image that Jesus shows us so clearly in his relationships? But can we do that? Can we give up the hope that finding another person who will fill those empty places in us can we give up that that will happen? Are we able to empty ourselves of everything and everyone else so that God can truly satiate our spirits? If we can, if we can make God our most important relationship, we will find all the grace and all the hope and all the peace that comes when all the fragments of our hearts are finally brought together and wholly connected for good. Would you all bow your hearts with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks for these amazing hearts you have given to each one of us. And we are so grateful for the hole in those hearts that you have given us that only you can fit and fill. Help us every day to try to make you fit better and more fully into our hearts. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.